Hi, and welcome to another episode of Hobo Prepper. I'm your host, Friar Tuck, and today we're going to be talking about the different hobo classes. And before we get started, though, I do want to thank Michael Horn at theyflyblog.com for sharing my video on his website. I feel a lot more comfortable knowing that I have a lot more like-minded people around me, so thank you again for your recent subscription. You might be asking yourself, why is this channel important? And what is it that I can learn from a hobo? The truth is, is that Billy Meyer gave us three predictions over the last few decades. Uh, the first prediction was that after 2020, the superpower USA would no longer exist. It almost seems as of January 1st, 2020, Loki hit the earth with a vengeance. So the second prediction was in 2017 in a contract report. You can find this on theyflyblog.com. Meyer talked about the elites using the next pandemic to gain control over the political and economic system. I could point a finger, but you know what? I'd like to keep my channel. Lastly, Meyer also predicted uh, that we would have a global economic collapse that we would never truly recover from. If you've watched the global economy since 2006 and the crash that became visible in 2008, the global economy has only recovered to be smacked down again by a pandemic, and now we've got a looming global conflict on our on the horizon. So. All the measures that we took in 2008, uh, all it did was delay the inevitable, making it more devastating uh, when the price is exacted to correct the system. Because if you if you ever listen to like Peter Schiff uh, or Ron Paul or any of those guys, the first thing they were saying back in 2008 through 2010, their big claim was that we need to fail now so that it won't be so painful later on because if we push it off into the future, it's going to be much more painful. And these guys, they tried to warn us and these were, you know, well-to-do hedge fund managers or, or financial analysts uh, or Ron Paul, he was a member of Congress. They all tried to remind us of this and, and let us know about this, but nobody listened. So... And this is what's on the horizon and is what I'm going to coin and what I would like to coin as the Great Dispossession, which Meyer is also recently warned about in one of his recent contact notes. Should you be one of the many affected by this, knowing the different classes of hobos and where they hang out, how they interact, and what your interactions will be like when you interact with them will be important. As much as this may seem trivial, uh, just to really drive the point home, um, if you don't, if you're not aware of the different classes, how they operate, and how the power structure works out there, uh, it doesn't matter who you are. You're not going to make it, or you're not going to have much success, or you're going to have a lot of misery. And so I, I urge you to strongly listen to this because this is essential in your survival and safety. Uh, should you ever be in an SHTF situation that puts you out and you have to live in the urban jungle. The first class I want to talk about is the junkie class. Now, I know it may sound harsh, you know, however, it's the only way to describe this group of hobos. For various reasons, these people got involved in the wrong drug that they just couldn't say no to. And, you know, on a side note, I knew a guy in San Francisco when he came back from Vietnam, his girlfriend, uh, uh, the woman that he thought he was going to marry, his high school sweetheart, uh, had broken up with him and started sleeping with another guy. This broke his heart, and he just basically crawled inside of a bottle after he got home from Vietnam. So it's not like all of a sudden, the, the way a person gets on these um, should really be considered, and instead of looking at the end result and condemning them for that, you should really understand that there are extenuating circumstances that bring a person to it. It's not like somebody wakes up one day and says, man, I want to shoot some heroin and get addicted and, and have withdrawals. No, there was something that brought them to that point, and that's really what you should understand about these hobos, because these hobos do generate the most money, although they do look the worst. You know, once I knew a hobo that had a $500 dollar a day crack habit which was still pretty small and it used to steal the telephone booth casings and send them to the scrap yard uh, the ones that are so far gone that there is no way to recover uh, those guys are the ones that you generally see panhandling but a large majority of them are your best thieves for the right price and you know you may find yourself in a situation where you might need one of those guys so 
don't discount them. They all have a role out there. The second class is the one I want to talk about it is the, the crazy class. Now, you may have heard about all these mental institutions that have been uh, closed down over the years. Well, these people end up out on the streets and they're not very hard to spot because they do get social security, yes, but there's a little bit more to it. So every, you know, everyone on the streets, they do something even if it's alcohol. Life on the streets, it's, it's really rough and you need something to take the edge off. The, the crazy class, these hobos, they're generally the ones, you know, who are better dressed. They don't have any drug habits, you know, but that's because they're so far gone that the drugs would take away from whatever it is that they're tripping on. I mean, I have met some, some super crazies out there and they, when, when you see them in, in their worst state, they are more twacked out than a tweaker, I guess you would say. Um, so you, you'd think that this would be part of the junkie class, but you know they're not. In my honest opinion, I think that the junkie class is basically one step before the crazy class. Uh, and I really wholeheartedly believe that because in order to make it to that crazy to where you're so crazy that what you're tripping on is better than what any drug can do for you you have to have you, you had to have gone uh, past the junkie class because i think that's like the stepping stone before the super crazy class and so the third class um are what i like to call the lazy class and these are usually the young kids coming out believing what mommy and daddy told them about the world and about fairness you know i was in san francisco's like 20 2006 7 um, and being in San Francisco, I got to see a lot of young and lazy people on the streets. To me, it seemed as if there was a greater number of those than the veteran hobos. I'm not talking about those that served in the military. I'm talking about hobos that have been out on the streets. There was a point when, when I first got to San Francisco because of the way that they have the shelter system set up. Where for every adult that I saw over the age of 30 there were three or four kids that I would see under the age of 20 that were out there in their shelters. And I still don't know how this was happening, but there was in the early 2000s before the, the economic collapse happened, there was this mass exodus of young people out on the streets. And I don't know why, but, um, you know, these people are usually the ones panhandling, trying to tell the best sob stories because they want to be able to make money. It's like, Mommy and Daddy told them they could do anything they wanted, and they said, well, I don't want to work, I just want to live, and so they created a system, and, you know, these guys, they make a lot of money, uh, they, they are as lazy as they may seem, uh, in order to make that money, uh, they kind of have to get rid of that lazy gene, because otherwise they really wouldn't make that money, so, um, I, I've even seen some of these guys use animals uh, as a way to gain sympathy and I really I really have no respect for that uh, and usually those people if somebody comes and takes their animal from them shortly it's usually another hobo because hobos are very protective of the animals uh, yes you may look at your animal as a companion but we look at animals as that is that is a tool that is a workhorse you've got a dog which can carry stuff, which can pull things, and can offer security, and also offers love. And so you get all that from, from an animal, and so hobos are very, very protective of dogs. Uh, dogs especially, I mean, cat, eh, but you know, when it comes to a dog, if you mistreat a dog, a hobo will come up and take your dog from you. So you better be nice to your animals. You know, and the fourth class, and generally the class that I fit into is the silent working class. Now, these people may not be making a lot of money. I mean, a couple hundred bucks a week, but you know, they generally have some sort of side work. I, if you watch my last video, I talked about some of the side projects that I had. Uh, these people, uh, like myself, generally started out on the streets by circumstances and decided to stay because of the freedom. And having to stay outside and you know, and having side money, 
uh, to be able to make and support yourself and keep your dignity makes a huge difference in your experience as a hobo. And, you know, I've heard personally had an experience where the cops have given me a pat on the back and left me alone because they respected what I was doing. You know, I could buy the gear I needed. I wasn't tied down by bills or obligations, allowing me to work as much or as little as I wanted. This may seem glorious and in the hobo world it is, but compared to the typical housey like you, um, it could be miserable. And these these are generally the hobos that you see at coffee shops in the morning or at a small diner in the morning. And you'll not see these hobos during the day unless they want to sit around and relax for the day in the park, maybe get some extra rest, you know, just sit back and relax. Because, and just let me kind of help you understand it from my point of view because I really relate to this class. Uh, because, look, I want to go to work. I want to be productive. But I want the money that I have and the work that I have to be put towards things that are going to be good for me. And if I have to go to work to put 80% of everything I make into uh, uh, rent, electricity, water, uh, and all of that before I even get to food. And then I barely have anything left over for food. And then I don't have any money for entertainment. Uh, you know, living outside, if you have a, a little bit of money, let's just say, you know, you should have like a hundred bucks a week minimum. You know, that, that way, if you're a smoker like me, you can buy your cigarettes. If you want to go buy a beer, uh, you can go do that. And that, that's perfectly fine. Uh, that's the freedom that it, it gives you. But also at the same time, if you're like, you know what? Um, it's a nice day out. I want to go hang out at the river and just like watch traffic go by and enjoy some peace and quiet without having to deal with the hustle and the grind. I got an extra 50 bucks in my pocket and that's probably going to last me for two or three days. So why don't I, um, you know, why don't I just take the day off? So you're not going to make a lot of money doing this, but it gives you a lot of freedom. Uh, in, in the 60s and 70s, they would have called these people the beatniks. And you know, I, I kind of relate to him. I see, uh, I see the benefit in it. Uh, the I see paying rent as an unnecessary burden. Uh, I, I can, uh, you know, I can go out there. I can go to work, and I can make uh, the money that I want to make, and then I can have the freedom that I want to have. And this is part of the reason why I was chronically homeless for so long, because the the thought that all of the money that you make goes towards rent, and you have nothing else left over. In a lot of ways, that's demoralizing. That's debilitating. That that just it, why do I want to go to work if I don't get to keep any of it? And all it does is go to pay other people. Sleeping outside is not a bad thing. Our ancestors have done it for hundreds of thousands of years, and so now all of a sudden it becomes socially taboo to be able to sleep outside, uh, and, and for various reasons. And I'm pretty sure I'll hear something in in the comments about this. But this is something I really want to drive home: is that very few of your homeless are actually really lazy. You can't be lazy and survive out there. I mean, it's possible, but it's really hard. Um, I've only met a few people who, who have mastered that. And it took them a lot of years to master their laziness. Uh, but you're, you're homeless. It's more or less circumstances and environment. And we'll talk about this over time. I don't want to get too much into it. So the last class is the criminal class. Uh, these are usually your dope dealers, your gangbangers. These guys make their money committing crime. Plain and simple, um, they're also the scariest people that you're going to come across. I, I had to... Uh, I had a guy get a joint off me one time and you know I even even though I didn't even make any money I was threatened for my life because the gang you know saw that that was their money and that I took their money away from them because I gave something away on something that they were supposed to make money on and if you get between a criminal and their dollars well you're gonna pay with your life and there's not gonna be any hesitation or remorse in it you know LA is the only place I experienced that but you know uh, I, I got to know other leaders of gangs uh, of the gang class with my travels I mean I've gotten to know Latin Kings and Aryan Nation Bloods and Crips and Mexican Mafia and old Italian Mafia and, and I, I will I will tell you this these guys they may seem like oh my god they're the bad they're the worst you should be afraid of them no you just there's just certain things you don't do 
you know you you don't show you don't show a, a red flag in front of a pissed off bull and you don't get between a dope dealer and his money that's just what you don't do and as long as you abide by that you're not going to have an issue uh, because the, at the same time these guys also offer protection to you all right you may not notice it or realize it or understand it, but having to or getting to know the gang leaders that I've gotten to know over the years in my travel as a hobo, it is in their best interest to keep, if they're on a street corner, that's your security. Those guys are going to keep everything on the down low because they don't want any problems. Because if, if there are problems, the cops get involved. These guys go to jail. It messes with them. They lose their money. So it's in their best interest to keep the dumb people from doing things. So if you need a safe place to hang around, sometimes going and hanging around the local da dope dealer might be a safe place for you. Because not only do they offer you security, but... If you ever have a problem and you're, you know, because you're probably going to go see him even, uh, unless you're going to the liquor store, you're going to go to see a dope dealer. Uh, it, it's it, it's just going to be the way it is. Uh, you it, go get your weed, go get your crack, go get your heroin, go get whatever it is that you're going to get. Um, you know, but that dope, dope dealer, if you do them right and you're always honest and, you know, you just go and get what you get. The thing that I've really wanted to drive home is that, Although these guys may seem scary, they're not uh, they're not scary if you get to know them. If you're intelligent and you can hold an intelligent conversation and you can actually give them stimulating, enlightening conversation, dope dealers, man, they'll have the biggest respect for you and you will get things that you normally wouldn't get to, you know, and th this happened to me a lot of times. Uh, there is a limit to everybody's patience and kindness, especially out on the streets when you don't have time for patience or kindness but these are the things that that you should really be aware of and you know I, again i want to say thank you for watching i hope that you found this valuable i do put affiliate links in the description from time to time if you want to help out the channel more than just a like a comment or a subscription um I do get a commission off of everything you buy through those links. So if you do that, I just want to say thank you in advance. And uh, thank you for watching. And I will see you on the next video.